Uh, State Work Play does work with uh, employers across the state, including some who are represented here in this room, you know, to really help fine tune you know, the work that we do in addition to our marketing, our branding, uh, our advocacy and other events that we put on for young people to really connect and bring them together. You know, that's because we are a, uh, as uh, my former colleague Beth Sansusi likes to uh, say, a small but mighty team. And uh, one of the benefits of that, though, is that we can be very nimble. So we definitely appreciate hearing from employers across the state to learn more about your particular industry and where you're located in the states uh, to really see, again, what we can do to make sure that we are being most effective at attracting and retaining young people here. And, you know, while it might not feel like it in this current climate, uh, we are seeing some success. I don't want to uh, leave everyone depressed with, uh, you know, some of the challenge, challenging stats that I gave earlier. Uh, but we are meeting with some success. It's modest, but you know, unlike you know, prior years when we really saw an out-migration, a net out-migration of young people, we are starting to see a net in-migration of people the last few years. And again, it's modest, but um, of those in their 20s and 30s, we're seeing about uh, 4,500, 5,000 a year. Of course, you know, that's nowhere near what we need to meet today's current workforce needs, to say nothing of the years to come. So we all have a lot of work to do. And uh, that's why I'm really excited today to hear from all of our panelists, you know, to learn more about what's going on today, right now here in New Hampshire, to meet the workforce needs of the clean energy economy. So kicking off our discussion today will be Aubrey Nelson, energy educator with the New Hampshire Energy Education Project. Welcome, Aubrey. Thank you. She started there. Cool. So I work for Veep and Meep. Um, I work with kids. I'm an educator. I'm also a project advisor. So I'm an action project advisor for kids looking to take energy or climate action. Um, and here's our mission. Essentially, we want to make sustainable communities. Um, we have a bunch of no or low cost programming for kids and for teachers. Um, and in terms of workforce, one of the things we do for our students and for all of you is to think about, okay, what do our students need? What do they want? This statistic, I love this little graphic because anecdotally, I can tell you that when I go into schools and work with young people, they say, I want a job that makes a difference. And anecdotally, I can say that, but fortunately, there are people doing these studies, polling people in Canada, Ghana, India, Pakistan, the UK, and the US, who all say, yes, we actually want not just a career, but we want a green career or something that advances social issues. Um, this is especially important if you're someone who is trying to hire more women, someone trying to hire more people of color, and trying to hire, well, young people generally. Oh, okay. Um, so what you can't see on there is uh, <laughs> that, that uh, women are more likely to be concerned about climate change, people of color are more likely to be concerned about climate change, and also more likely to look for ways to do something about it. Um, and indigenous peoples have an especially large role in this and large concern around this as well. And as we try to think about incorporating traditional ecological knowledge into our solution, catering to those communities also means hmm, maybe we pay attention to, in our business, not just the profit, but the planet and the people. Hmm. Will it work in Google Slides? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we can also look at it without being in slideshow mode as well, whatever. Okay, so um, how do we specifically support workforce development? There are a few different ways. One is that we have um, workshops for any school, any educators, K through 12 across New Hampshire and Vermont. We can come in and do a program, many of which are are focused around green energy careers um, or generally understanding energy. Um, and one of the reasons that we like to do that is because if kids have their hands on equipment and they are thinking like engineers, they can imagine themselves being in those positions. And more and more 
in the workforce, we're not seeing folks going in and having one career for the rest of like, I'm going to be a blank and that's it. We see people like myself included who need to, to transition as we get new skills and have different priorities and certainly understanding how to figure things out and think like an engineer is useful in any field. But then under, feeling confident about like, yeah, electricity is not that scary. It's not this like big empty bubble. Oh, cool, a motor and a generator are the same thing except one converts electricity into motion and one converts motion into electricity. So if I'm lost in the desert, uh, zombie apocalypse, whatever it is, like, ooh, I could figure this out. And that's empowering for students. Um, if you want to, to bring this information to schools, please do. We offer free programming, especially bring it to teachers because we are only a certain number of us, but we love to empower teachers to do this work. We, all of our workshops are run again in the same way of the teachers become students and we teach the way that we want them to teach. Um, we also have a weatherization education pilot program happening in the North Country. This is a little bit more focused around career development. Um, it includes an energy audit and blower door field trip. Melissa from Clean Energy Ham New Hampshire is gonna help us out with the blower door this year, which is really exciting. Um, a build-a-thon challenge to think about can students do a weatherization work um, in a like engineering design process. And then generally, we also still work, offer those workshops to kind of bridge the gap for students between, okay, yes, this is how to do the work, and this is how much it costs or how much it pays and all this stuff, but then also, why does it matter? Because like I showed on that first slide, why it matters matters even more to people in this upcoming generation. Um, and then speaking of that, one of our biggest initiatives and something I'm really excited to be involved in is our Youth Climate and Energy Action Project support. So there's actually one student here today, she's in the EV session, um, who's trying to install EV chargers at her Kearsarge High School. That is her senior project. We also have the Youth Climate Leaders Academy, which brings students from all across both states together. The first launch is kind of an ideation, like what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? And then the next piece of that is what are the actual transferable skills that we need to do those things? So we get students together, the camaraderie is awesome, they feel empowered by just having each other there, but then they also get to learn, hmm, how do you write a grant? Um, how do you speak to an audience? How do you set up a meeting? So any of these things are not only workshops they can do, but also workshops they then lead because they're involved with our program and then they start to lead that program. So those t transferable skills are applicable in any work setting. Uh, I don't know if this will still work. No. Yeah, but I'm going to slide the mode and I'll shut down. Um, <laughs> so um, how do we do this? This is just like a couple of examples. I've talked about them a little bit already. We try to bring the data um, and say, okay, you have a question about this? Let's figure it out. Where are there going to be more jobs? What are they going to pay? Next slide. This is some pictures from our North Country Weatherization Project last year. Um, Andy Duncan actually worked with me on this um, and was able to provide the blower door last year, which is really great. And this is uh, some students thinking about, like, they came together and thought about, why does my work on this house matter for the world? Um, which was pretty cool. Next slide. This is what, a little bit of what it looks like in a classroom. Um, this is down in Portsmouth. They built a model Christmas village. Um, with, um, and then thinking about LED versus incandescent lighting um, and insulation engineering challenges for younger kids. Next slide. Okay, this is one of those ones that has like a bazillion and three transitions that you can't fully get the um, effect of without it. But youth are doing this work across the state, whether we're helping them or not. So my call to all of you is help them. <laughs> um, and so these are just some of the things going on. CEO Students for Sustainability is an all student organized nonprofit. Their executive director is a student. Their policy director is a student, testifies on bills regularly. And they're doing a lot of really great work around the seacoast, trying to grow that to other parts of the state. Spalding High School, one of the most impacted communities, Rochester, um, that we have in terms of 
faux, you know, power plants, having, uh, you know, all sorts of effects downwind of that. Um, Rivendell is over by, it's in Orford, so it's over by um, the border with Vermont. In fact, they're a bi-state school. This is one of their systems maps that we do at our YCLA event. Here's our Regional High School just banned plastic bags in New London. White Mountains Regional High School is covered up by their picture. Um, did a ton of work, and you'll hear from one of their students in a second. Hanover High School was the first climate action plan written by students in the country that I know about. Um, so there's a ton of stuff, and then Belmont Climate Summit has been happening for the last few years. Don't know what's happening. We want to help all of these efforts come together and help them help to connect with you all so that all of our efforts can be working together and you can have youth at the table. Okay, next one. All right, so are we going to be able to listen to Vic? <laughs> This is Victoria. She's from White Mountain Regional High School. What are we going to say, Vic? This is. Um, so just a little bit about SAUCE. SAUCE was founded back when I was a freshman, so 2019. I'm a senior now. It's in its fourth year. Um, our original purpose was for uh, to make presentations for one specific grant. Um, it was a USDA grant, I believe. Um, and we had a proposal for solar power and we had a proposal for um, a recycling program and Back in 2020 we ended up winning our solar grant, um, which was hundred and seven thousand dollars, which was really exciting um, And with that grant we put an LED lights in the entire school um, Which because that was our first step towards solar um, we didn't we kind of we we used too much energy in the building um for solar, so we wanted to make our energy, our lighting specifically, a lot more energy efficient so that solar would be um, something that we would be able to look into. Um, so that was a really huge project and something that we're really proud of. Um, <clears throat> one of the struggles with that was the, was really supportive of it, which helped a lot. Um, and this year, We've kind of, like kind of drilled four, into people's heads, like, 40. hey, this is a really for another grant from the Rotary Club, our lo local Rotary Club. Um, and it was a very long grant. We spent lots, like 20 pages, spent months on it, um, basically proposing a sustainable school transition. And we did get $7,000 from that grant. Um, and we're going to be using that this year for recycling, for composting. Um, a project we want to do is a native slash pollinator garden which of course if, um is very good for our local biodiversity and we thought it would be a really good way for people to get involved um so yeah and also this year we are going to or last year we had solar walkthroughs we met with a couple different solar companies and they told us like maybe where we could have our panels stuff like that this year we're really going to dive into looking for grants um for solar um and yeah that's about it um if I, if I would lead off with anything, I guess the most valuable thing I've learned besides like actually doing these projects, like taking the steps, applying for the grants, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff is really just like connecting with the people in the school and trying to get them to actually care about it um, in a way that relates to them. Um, and I think that was one of our most valuable things that we learned. Um, so yeah, that's sauce. Thank you very much. And have a good rest of your day. <laughs> Um, so they, that connects back to the keynote this morning. They found that they had to connect to the other, their fellow students about, okay, what do the other students care about and how can we make this happen based on their concerns? Go to the, so this is, these are some of the things that you gain through our programs, but then the follow-up question is, okay, what can you give them? So my next slide. Um, we are always looking for energy action uh, consultants or experts. If you know something and know how to get a project move forward, connect with us. We would love to help connect you to young people trying to do the work. Um, if you would, if you're really knowledgeable and want to record a short video about your green energy career as part of our youth energy fair, that's open to anyone who wants to watch it. 
Um, you can connect folks with their local energy committees, committees, make those introductions, be in the spaces that students cannot be because they have class at 1030 <laughs> or whatever else is going on in their life. Um, sponsor or spread the word about our programs. I have a bunch of programs up here as well as some postcards, which if you would like to pass them out, um, I would like to take some, you can send them. If you have ideas for people who might want to sponsor uh, a team to go to y or YCLA, for instance, um, and you can send that and hope that someone pays us some money. Um, and then greening your business to attract youth looking for more than a job because the numbers are showing that they are in fact looking for more than a job. Um, and so here are some of the other things that we have, small grants, we have money to give schools if they wanna do projects. Um, we have a whole little pamphlet also up here that I can hand out around if you want to work with schools and you are a community member, what does that look like? What are some tips that you can take away um, from that project? So we have a booth out in the other room. Come play with our stuff. Um, ask us more. Get our free posters. Tell your teachers about our programming. Um, and you're welcome to ask me any questions as well at the end of the session. Thanks. Thank you, Aubrey. Great to uh, learn so much about all of this great work being done uh, with youth across the state. Next up, we have Dr. Jeffrey Beard, who is the Deputy State Director of Career and Technical Education and Bureau Administrator with the Bureau of Career Development at the New Hampshire Department of Education. Welcome, Dr. Beard. Thank you, Will. My hat's off to Will to be able to say my title, and it helps me because I don't have to say it because it's far too long. Uh, but essentially, I, I run the Bureau of Career Development at the New Hampshire Department of Education. Uh, the Bureau of Career Development, uh, the mission that we work on every day is to provide visible and accessible career pathways for young people in the state. Um, one of the key ways that we do that is by overseeing um, a smallish federal grant, about $6 million, to support CTE. So quick show of hands, if I say the, the acronym CTE, are you familiar with the acronym? Okay, now there are two, there's the good CTE and there's the bad CTE. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm in charge of the good CTE. Um, but if you take a look at the, uh, the map up here, uh, this map represents the uh, regional high school CTE centers and the uh, seven community colleges in the community college system of New Hampshire. So just a, a quick uh, challenge, uh, take a mental note and then look to see where you live in the state or where you work in the state. Pick one of the centers, and then what I'm gonna challenge you to do is reach out to the, the administrator of that center or the coordinator of the community college uh, and ask if you can take a tour. Um, you'll be amazed at what you'll see that's going on in, in the centers. And, and as you can see, we have our newest center that just came online up there, North Point in Colebrook. Uh, and then it goes all the way down to the seacoast. So we have some, some pretty good coverage. Uh, we have between 26 and 28, depending on who you ask. Uh, the, the discrepancy is really, is we, we have a couple of agricultural sub-centers that have recently become full uh, CTE centers. Next. Thank you, that would be great. So in terms of accessibility for the high school, um, students may complete, uh, may begin, yes. Oh, um, my apologies. Uh, CTE stands for Career and Technical Education. Uh, so students may begin Career and Technical Education, or CTE, uh, after they complete one year of high school. So typically that means uh, sophomore year. Uh, the reason the language is, is in the law that way, a young person could repeat ninth grade and still enter into uh, CTE. It's open to all high school age students. So students that are in public schools, students that, that are in non-public schools, uh, students that are homeschooled. And one thing that we make sure we do, transportation across the state is always a challenge. Uh, we have some, some real geographic uh, barriers to, to think about. So the Department of Ed does uh, reimburse uh, to sending schools that send students on a bus or who self-transport if a bus is not available to the regional um, high school CTE centers. Next. So CTE uh, programs at the high school level um, must have the following. 
Uh, community colleges is a slightly different set of criteria. Those are determined largely by the community colleges. I know we have Andy here today who's gonna speak uh, to that, uh, but essentially they must have a program advisory committee. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of these as I go. Um, it must have a post-secondary education or training connection. There must be an opportunity to earn an industry recognized credential or an IRC. There has to be an opportunity to take part in work-based learning. And then finally, it must be competency-based. So the Program Advisory Committee or PAC, it's made up of representatives from employers in the region served by the center. So for all of you that uh, represent employers that are in the energy sector, uh, at the end of this, I'll talk about a number of CTE programs that line up pretty neatly with, with energy and with the sector. Those program advisory committees are, should be made up of folks representing industry. Now, there should also be some representation from that post-secondary connection, uh, because that's important too, to have that seamless transition, secondary, post-secondary workforce. What the PAC does is it provides information to the teacher. So it basically says, these are the, the trends in industry, these are the needs in the industry, these are the, um, the equipment that we're using, these are things that we're projecting out in the next decade. And it really allows you, I've, I don't use a lot of uh, sports metaphors, but I think this one is valuable. Uh, you don't want to skate where the puck is, you want to skate where the puck is going to be. And that's what PACs do, that's why it's so important. Um, they coordinate donations of equipment, time and money to the program. Uh, there is a, uh, a tax um, credit plan uh, at the state, it's about half a million dollars available annually to businesses that donate either time, equipment, or money to CT programs. And they also might serve as work-based learning providers. Uh, so either in the places of employment or in simulations in the lab, shop, uh, lab, or, uh, lab or shop. And I'll talk more about work-based learning when I get to that, that piece. The post-secondary connection. So an articulated or dual enrollment credit with CCSNH or university system schools. Uh, so kids that are in high school CTE programs which really run the full gamut from business to auto technology, to welding, to building construction trades, to cosmetology. All of the students have an opportunity to either earn articulated credit, meaning that they will receive credit if they attend the school, or they actually get the credit prior to, to entering into the post-secondary. Uh, another really important part of the post-secondary are apprenticeship hours. Uh, so for some of our programs that don't have a necessarily a clear cut post-secondary college option, uh, most often cosmetology is a good example. Another good example are um, the various trades. Those apprenticeship hours that you can earn well in high school really give students a major advantage. Um, in some cases, they can come out with a year's worth of apprenticeship completely completed. And this is true of electrical programs as well as cosmetology. By the time they're done with high school, they have one year of the typical two year apprenticeship um, program done. And then finally, again, it provides that formal continuum between secondary and post-secondary. So in terms of creating a visible career pathway for kids, they're not sort of saying, well, I'll kind of go through high school and then I'll do something after high school. It's saying, if you have this uh, aspiration, this is a career you want to go into, here's the formal steps you can take to get there. Okay, next. All right, so IRCs are industry recognized credentials. Uh, this is our formal state definition for the state of New Hampshire. It's the culminating evidence of a learner's proficiency and competencies that equip them for a productive career in a specific industry domain. Uh, IRCs can include licenses, certificates, badges. It, it's really anything that distinguishes you on your resume gets you a job interview. It's something that is a formal uh, statement of your ability, your competency. And really, the part about uh, the R in IRC is recognized. So it's got to have currency for employers. It has to be something that's meaningful to employers to say, okay, that skill set is something we definitely need. This provides evidence of that skill set. We'll consider this person for a job. Okay, work based learning. So again, this is our state de definition it's a sustained applied educational experience. So it's not just a single uh, a day where you go and, and tour a facility, it's something over time. It gets students ready for work by applying core competencies. It expands their knowledge and exposure to career pathways. 
designed around authentic real world ex experiences, environments, and it can be credit bearing. So there's a full range of work-based learning opportunities that the state has. Uh, we do have in my office a state work-based learning coordinator, Nicole Levesque. Uh, if you go to the Bureau of Career Development website, you can contact uh, Nicole. She'd love to talk more. Okay, next. Uh, competencies are things that students know and are able to do. It has to be demonstrable or observable. They're developed by CTE teachers in conjunction with and significant in input from employers. We do have a set of common competencies and you'll see that they're really related to employability. So this idea of correct terminology, vocabulary, effective communication, uh, time and project management, applied mathematics and measurement, um, and awareness strategies to work safely. Next. Um, and last but not least, I just want to talk real quickly on some, some really clear-cut energy uh, adjacent CT programs. So uh, electrical programs, plumbing programs, HVAC, engineering, drafting design, auto tech. We have a number of uh, auto tech programs working on EVs, including at the community college level. Lakes Region Community College has a spark uh, vehicle. Uh, the building and construction trades, uh, welding, and then finally information technology. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, next up, we have Andy Duncan, who is the Workforce Development Coordinator and Energy Training Coordinator at Lakes Region Community College. Welcome, Andy. Thank you, Will. Good to be here. And I think we're gonna do that with the clicker. So uh, uh, my name is Andy Duncan. Uh, if you could go back to the previous slide and uh, contact information there. So Community College System of New Hampshire, CCSNH. So that is the whole community college system. And then one of those is Lakes Region Community College, LRCC, where, where I am at. So next slide. So just to give you an idea where the seven community colleges are, does the pointer work here? Maybe if you could see it up north, White Mountain Community College, WMCC, Lakes Region Community College in the middle of the state, NHTI stands for New Hampshire Technical Institute in Concord, River Valley Community College along the, uh, the western border, Upper Valley, Great Bay Community College over on the seacoast, and right here in Manchester, Manchester Community College, and then down in Nashua, Nashua Community College. So seven community colleges, 12 campuses, I just want to read, this is a part of the mission statement for the community college system of New Hampshire. Our purpose is to provide residents with affordable, accessible education and training that aligns with the needs of New Hampshire's businesses and communities. So very much like what you're hearing from Jeff with the CTE program, that we want to make sure that a skilled New Hampshire workforce is also means a very strong New Hampshire economy. So next slide. And um, there's a lot of different clean energy jobs that are out there. And if you're curious about this whole kind of career area, I encourage you to take a look at Interstate Renewable Energy Council, IREC. They have three different uh, clean energy career maps. And so the one I'm showing you right here is the one just for green buildings career map. And there's 55 jobs just in that green buildings career map. There's another 40 jobs in the solar career map and there's another 40 jobs in the climate control technology career map. So we're talking over 100 different positions right there. So it's, it's a challenge of saying, how are we gonna have training programs for all of those different types of positions? But there's lots of positions. As we well know, there's gonna be a big increase in this whole sector. So next slide. And uh, I was gonna do this as kind of a little dot, 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 but we just got the whole thing here. So um, I think we all can agree that if we're thinking about a clean energy career, it's a combination of education and experience. And you heard from Jeff about the CTE, Career Technical Education Centers at the high school level, a very important foundation. As Jeff mentioned, lots of connections with the community colleges and their programs. And kind of the bread and butter of the community college system is the associate degree. And so that's a two year, 60 college credit degree um, lots of different areas. I'll talk about a couple of them. 
but I also want to, and, and a lot of those get connected to bachelor's degrees and higher level degrees. And so there's a lot of two plus two programs uh, with the UNH system, university system in New Hampshire, and, and other uh, articulation opportunities beyond that associate degree. But I also want to talk about what uh, Jeff was mentioning as the, uh, and we do have a lot of acronyms here, but the, uh, the IRCs, the uh, industry recognized credentials, and the short term professional programs that can be associated with those industry certifications. Uh, and then apprenticeships are really important and kind of coming on strong as a way to combine on the job learning, that workplace learning with uh, structured education. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Oops. Did I just click it? Wow. Okay. Well, we'll just have to hope that it keeps on working. Uh, so I just want to talk about a few different uh, clean energy programs that are existing now in the community college system of New Hampshire. So over at Lakes Region Community College, there's the energy program. Kind of interesting in that it is not an associate degree program. It's more the short term professional trainings. So one of them, for example, is with BPI, Building Performance Institute. They have a certification uh, called Building Analysts. That's for residential energy auditors. And we have a seven day training and exams that are associated with that. And then there's another one called Building Operator Certificate. And that's more for say like a manager of a facility like this, large commercial industrial uh, types of facilities. And that's also a IRC, industry recognized credential that is uh, with building operator certification kind of national organization. Uh, there's also rural renewables, and that's a little bit different take on education in the sense that that's a technical assistance program that we have where we can provide free, no cost technical assistance to uh, rural small businesses throughout New Hampshire. And so a little bit different kind of angle on the education side of things. And then also, as, as Aubrey mentioned, there's the North Country Weatherization Workforce uh, Program pilot grant that uh, Lakes Region Community College was working with several different organizations, including NHEP, also Tri-County Community Action Program, which is a large employer up in the North Country for those weatherization installers that do the air sealing and insulation and things like that. So next slide. So kind of continuing in that vein of green buildings programs uh, at here in Manchester at Manchester Community College is a very large program, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, HVAC. Uh, that includes a kind of standard associate degree, but actually four different certificates, one to two year certificates, as well as non-credit training in that whole area, which is more and more uh, very important, you know, getting into things like heat pumps and refrigeration, in addition to kind of the standard combustion fuels and whatnot. And then in HTI, I think Jeff might have mentioned, there's a <coughs> architectural engineering technology program. So that's for aspiring architects and engineers. They can keep on going to uh, Keene State for architecture or UNH Manchester for mechanical engineering. Next slide. And so another really important sector is transportation sector. And I think there actually is somebody from New Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association who's gonna be speaking at this conference. They um, are connected up with the manufactured sponsored automotive technicians program. And it's a really good example of a trade association helping to kind of move the needle of uh, getting people interested, particularly high school students, interested in a career as a automotive technician. And to the extent that those manufacturers are coming out with EVs and other innovative vehicles, those technicians are gonna know how to service them as well. And then at White Mountain Community College is a new electric vehicle technician program. It's a one year certificate. And this is actually working on one of those switch uh, EVs that several of the community colleges have uh, this is example up at White Mountain Community College. And with electrical programs, you know, that's really, really important. You think about all this kind of electrification themes uh, that are coming out, that we really need a lot more electricians and other people that are in this sector. And so we're, you know, it's not just buildings, it's also transportation, <laughs> infrastructure, other systems. And so both Lakes, Re Lakes Region Community College and Manchester Community College have electrician uh, training programs. And then you're also going to hear from Vaughn with revision about their really innovative uh, program. And I'll just point out that at LRCC, they do have a solar photovoltaics course as part of that training. It's a, a 
it's an elective course, but a lot of the students take it. And so they get some introduction into installing solar as part of their electrician training. And then a really interesting program at Manchester Community College is a line worker program. It's a two semester program, has an 18 month internship. And it was an interesting partnership with uh, Eversource saying we need more line workers. And Eversource at Manchester Community College got together to develop this program. It's also with IBEW, International Brotherhood of uh, Electrical Workers. Next slide. And so I mentioned apprenticeship, and Apprenticeship NH is a program that uh, has gotten a fair amount of funding from the U.S. Department of Labor to kind of spread apprenticeship and apprentice opportunities throughout the state. And uh, I love the, uh, the tagline with Apprenticeship NH, earn as you learn. So the, you know, the whole idea of apprentices is that work-based learning, that on-the-job learning, combined with some sort of structured education. It can be as short as 144 contact hours, so not necessarily a whole associate degree, or it can be an associate degree or even something longer than that. And um, a lot of the assistance that Apprenticeship NH provides is with employers, providing some financial as well as technical assistance. So hopefully those of you who represent employers in the room, you're kind of listening and uh, uh, some great opportunities there. And for the apprentices themselves, it's a great uh, career path advancement uh, opportunity in the sense that they can see two to three years, typical apprenticeship, you know, what that career looks like. And as they get to higher levels, more experience, more training, they also get more pay. And that's nice kind of having that all built into that apprenticeship. I clicked that one. Or did you click? One of us clicked. Um, so just kind of finishing up here, last two slides. Uh, I guess I could say I'm, I'm old enough to experience, to have experienced the, the ARA era uh, where there was a lot of money pumped into clean energy back 10, 12 years ago. And that was interesting. And so, you know, the question to you, maybe statement, maybe question, this time it's different? I don't know. But I can say, and I'm not going to go over all these numbers, but there's a lot of money in the Inflation Reduction Act as well as in the uh, infrastructure law that is associated with education and training. And so the big question I think that we all should be asking here in New Hampshire is, are we going to be able to go after that money? Or is it the other states around us that are going to be getting the money? Because we have, what I say, formidable neighbors. Maine has a very impressive program going on. They put in some of the ARPA money into uh, clean energy workforce development. Massachusetts, of course, Connecticut, for sure, uh, Vermont. They're all, in my opinion, doing more than we are right now in clean energy workforce development. And so the question is, uh, are we going to be able to move that clean energy workforce needle? Uh, and I think it's going to take a concerted effort. It's, you know, it's going to take more than just uh, where we are right now. And so my uh, kind of call to action, particularly those of you who represent employers, is to get in touch with, you certainly can get in touch with me, but get in touch with Becky Lewis, who is the director of workforce development at the Community College System of New Hampshire. And her contact information is here. You could do just a search for workforce development, community college system in New Hampshire, and you'll get the names of the different people at the seven different colleges who, uh, who help with workforce development. And so the question, are there some clean energy trainings that you want to see happen? You know, the more that employers speak up and say, we need this type of training and we're going to employ people who, who go through that training, or we're going to even send our employees to that training, the more that the, the community college system in New Hampshire is going to, um, to be able to set up programs. And are there apprenticeship pathways that we can help set up? You know, I think that's a really great opportunity that's out there. So I look forward to your questions after the end of, uh, of all the presentations. Thank you, Andy. And, um, for our final presentation this morning, we have Vaughn Woodruff, who is the director of the Revision Energy Training Center. Welcome, Vaughn. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so uh, Revision Energy, uh, many of you probably know us. We have two branches here in New Hampshire, one in Brentwood, as well as one up in Enfield. Um, thank you for having me as a visitor. I am from Maine. so. I know you all are number two oldest state, we're number one. So, so I don't wanna rub it in, but, um, and that's a challenge that we have. Revision has two branches up in Maine as well. Uh, and so 
We are trying to address the climate crisis with two of the most challenging labor pools to work from. And so what I'm gonna talk about today um, is a little bit about our program, but I'm gonna talk more broadly about the position of workforce. So we're gonna start, uh, rather than uh, have me talk about our program, uh, we thought we would bring in the voices of apprentice apprentices within our program. So wh why don't we go ahead with that, Beth? I realized I needed like a solid job with some insurance and you know a path and a direction that I can go in and some stability. I used to walk by this place when it was on Presumpscout Street and my friend Darren who I worked with at the moving company worked here and I was like he's a funny odd guy and if he loves it here that's a good sign and I knew I liked doing like some building stuff and I liked being outside and I liked the the goal of the company in general. And so I kind of took a chance and applied. I didn't even know about the school actually. And when I found that out, I was like, holy moly. <laughs> Cause that's a great opportunity as someone who has a kid, doesn't have a lot of money and there's like free schooling that I just like super motivating. I think electricians play an essential role in fighting climate change. I mean, we have to, transition off of fossil fuels. So we need a different form of energy. We need to update the grid. One electrician can only do so much work in a year. So definitely need more. REAP is a little bit different than a traditional electrical apprenticeship, especially one that I went through. We know the need of skilled workers and specifically in our industry. And this goes, it's not just our industry, but this goes across all of the trades, but specifically for solar, alternative energy, we cannot get enough people and we want to provide an opportunity you know for anyone who is interested to have a chance to excel with different paths and programs that we can set forth for them offering all of this in-house is a huge advantage to us as we're not relying on a community college um, you know a voc program our coursework we can offer that so it's not directly affecting you know their their work schedules so the apprenticeship program at revision has definitely like jump-started my career you know i was not an electrician before i came here <laughs> so and i might not have become an electrician if i didn't come here and the the hands-on learning um with the you know online schooling the fact that you can learn in different types of ways um, was definitely the right way for me to learn how to do this. We know, myself included, you know, everybody has a family or has a life outside of work. We want people to, to not live to work. You know, we want people to, to have a life. So offering this program that can kind of cater to doing things besides working your 40 hours a week is critical. It feels like this is something that I can do that's actually helpful in, in like an active, physical way like boots on the ground type work to helping address the climate crisis. I have a future in this and not just my career, but also like helping people around me, like my friends and my family. If I, it's like a thing I use every day. I, I like that it's physical. I love that there's like all these puzzles you have to solve all the time. I love being outside. I love the travel. Um, I love the people and I love that I keep learning all the time. Like every day there's something new. So that's why I let them talk. They're going to be way more inspiring than I am. Um, you know, we're Revision Energy is an employee owned B Corp. So, you know, beyond just the profit motive, we are grounded in our communities and in our workers. And so the folks that you see here are apprentices and they also co-own this business with me and with 370 other employees that are working, you know, on a broader mission of addressing the climate crisis. And I could get up here and talk to you about our program and I'll, I'd be happy to answer questions during the Q&A. Um, but I want to recognize, right? I looked at the other four sessions just so I could say this with some authority. Um, you all chose the most important session to be in and we're in the smallest room and half of the seats are empty, right? 
When it comes to climate crisis, with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, we now have right, the framework and the money to do this work. And so right now, the number one bottleneck is what we are talking about right now. Right? Next year, one of my goals is for this to be in the biggest room and for everybody to be nodding their heads and recognizing this piece and thinking about the work that we do in a much different way. Because if we go to employers and you ask their number one challenge right now, it is workers. Right. And for our industry, it's about quality workers who we can train to be in this industry and make sure we give the benefits that we can get out of it. Um, and so, you know, we have been embarking, um, as was mentioned in the keynote, uh, you know, our training center in conjunction with our marketing department has said, listen, we have the longest construction timelines we've ever had. Workforce is where we need to be putting our energy. Um, and it can't just be workers that we're looking for. I have a master's degree in education. I sit on the main workforce board. I used to, I, I developed and ran an employee owned B Corp that merged with Revision about a year and a half ago. Um, I've seen a lot of sides of this. And I know, and I know many of you in this room probably know as well, we need a cultural shift in trades education in this country. We can't have it be a second class educational pathway where we put kids as the last option before they drop out of the schools. And so we have embarked on another campaign um, to make this work happen. And so Beth, I don't know if you could go ahead and put up our other video. Did you know that the US will need more than 1 million new electricians by 2030? And that for every new electrician we train in the next decade, two electricians are expected to retire or change careers. Less than 2% of all electricians are women. We have the solutions to fix the climate crisis, but we just don't have the electricians to do it. I don't want a job that's boring. I don't want to sit behind a desk. I don't want to be tens of thousands of dollars in debt when I'm 25. It's time you reconsider how you talk to kids about the trades. Everyone, everyone, everyone needs to hear us. I want to save the world. This is the feeling that we need to carry into the work that we do to elevate the work that happens behind the scenes. My life has largely been, my professional career has largely been kind of what we say in the cuts, right? In the bureaucracies, in the how do we solve these problems? It's not going to be glamorous. And solar energy did not become prominent in Maine, for instance, where I worked on policy for well over a decade um, because of the nuts and bolts that happens. It's the stories that we tell. Right. And we need to undergo an epiphany in this country. And as I was getting ready, I was having a conversation yesterday and reminded um, and I'm just going to read to you a little bit here. Um, one of my one of my personal inspirations is Ray Anderson. I don't know if you all know Ray Anderson, who was the founder of Interface, which is a carpet company. So you might judge me and say pretty weird to have a <laughs> person who's inspiring. Right. There's the owner of a carpet company. Their customers, you know, I think probably 15 years ago, started asking, what is your sustainability plan? And that made it up the chain to Ray Anderson. They said, we're going to have a sustainability conference. And we need you to come and kick this off with some sort of keynote, keynote address. And he said, well, I've never thought of this. Um, I guess I'll do some homework. And the book Ecology of Commerce came across his desk. And he read that book. And... I'm sorry, <laughs> I'll try and hold myself together. But he read that book and talked about re-envisioning the work that he does, right? As in the future, he would be put in jail for the things that they did having to do with extraction of resources and the world that we're leaving for the next generations. And for me, if, if you ever have a chance to see him, there's a movie called The Corporation, which highlighted him. There's a new documentary that came out. He would stand in front of huge ballrooms of CEOs and talk about we are plunderers and we need to change the way that we do things. They have a carpet product that is actually carbon negative, 
right? They have made this commitment. He died a few years ago, um, but he's an inspiration of this idea of an epiphany and what it can do. But it's not just Ray. I was reading, I got a chance to finally read his book. I had had it on my shelf for a long time. There are other people that are important here. And so he went to that, he went to give that keynote and basically dropped this bomb on the company and said, we are going to be, car we are going to climb what they call Mount Sustainability, which means we're going to have no waste and be carbon neutral by 2020. And all the employees were like, what are you even talking about? And he just walked out of the room and said, you have two days to figure it out. <laughs> and there was a scuttle and everyone was naysaying and Ray's gone crazy and all of this. Um, and there was a gentleman uh, Graham Scott, who was the sixth employee interface that stood up. Um, and this is what he said. I know what it means to make compromises, he told the others. As the head of a family, as the provider, I've had to go a lot of, with, along with a lot of things I didn't agree with. We've all made compromises like that, haven't we? And everyone nodded. He's like, oh, great, we're going to find compromise. And this is where he went with it. If we can make these changes... If we can transform a company that uses so much energy, so much oil, that wastes so much, if we can do all that profitably, then any business can do it. No one will have an excuse. And if we can show that to the world, I think it will make up for all the compromises we've had to make in our lives. Every one of them. And then he sat down. If Graham hadn't stood up, Interface would not have been able to carry forward Ray's mission. So. As we leave here with workforce and we go to the other sessions that are, they're good, but they're not as important as this one. <laughs> um, I just want us to think about those epiphanies in the work that we do and how is it that we take this work and make sure it sees the attention because the numbers that we have run in 2030, we will have less than half of the electricians that we need to implement the climate goals that we have. It's not just we're missing it by a little bit. It's we're missing it by a lot, and we're going to need fundamental change in the way that we see trades education if we are actually going to attack this crisis. So thank you.